So tonight's topic is epigenetics, and we do have a special, special guest. This is Dr. Frank Sabatino, and he runs the Balance for Life retreat program in Deerfield Beach, Florida. And this retreat is a vegan lifestyle education center. It's specializing in plant-based nutrition, health rejuvenation, stress management, therapeutic fasting, and detoxification. And in this lifestyle, we need this a lot. And Dr. Sabatino is a chiropractic physician who also has a PhD in cellular biology and neuroendocrinology. And as an assistant professor at the University of Texas School of Medicine, he did extensive landmark research on calorie restriction, stress, and aging, and has published a number of major papers in the fields of cellular biology, aging, endocrinology, and neuroscience. Wow. So thank you tonight for being on Talking Tuesday. Dr. Thank you, Jeannie. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, gosh. Tell us about your program, Balance for Life. What is it that you guys do down there besides get nice and tan and healthy and get that vitamin D in there? Yeah, it's not too shabby being right on the ocean, but the place is set up. So it's a very small, intimate health and lifestyle retreat where people come in, can be exposed to a complete vegan, whole food, plant-based approach. Or if they decide that they want to do something a little bit more restrictive, we do have therapeutic water fasting to deal with more pathological conditions. But our program is, is centered around the eating uh, program, but it's also centered around an ongoing fitness program, a stress management program that involves daily yoga, tai chi, qigong, some degrees of meditation. So it's a, it's a, it's a full service lifestyle retreat where people can really step back from the chatter and hectic nature of their lives and commit to uh, a jumpstart on a new health program. Yeah. Well, don't you teach the, some of the Tai Chi? I do. T I teach Tai Chi and a little bit of the Qigong. I've been doing that for many years of my life. And it's been a major part of my own stress management and my own health program, really, for many, many years. Wow. Well, I know you've got with the National Health Association, you've got a retreat coming up January 5th through the 9th. Tell us what's going on there. Yeah, well, what we've done, you know, we have this beautiful location right on the ocean in Deerfield Beach, Florida. We're in the Wyndham Hotel, so we have a very private program within the context of the hotel. And we decided that this would be such an amazing place for people in the plant-based world to use as a functional retreat center to bring their own groups of people that can go in this ongoing education in this natural, healthy lifestyle. So we're doing our first retreat sponsored by the National Health Association, January 5th to the 9th. And the speakers are all handpicked by me, some of the best speakers in the country, Dr. Alan Goldhammer from True oh. North, Stefan Esser from Northern Florida, Victoria Moran, who's a friend of mine for over 40 years, who runs Main Street Vegan in uh, New York, a fantastic speaker. We have major chefs that'll be doing food demo. Uh, Colin Cook, our major chef, Katie May from out in California. And then people will also be able to do our complete program. So there'll be fitness programs, all the food, but now this added dimension of these incredible speakers sharing their knowledge and all of us living in this little community. And we're going to keep it to like 100 to 125 people, very intimate. So we're excited. This is going to be our jump off for the new year, a jumpstart health program. And I urge people to come if they can. It's going to be a remarkable, remarkable program. Oh, my gosh. I wish I could go, but... Unfortunately, some of us have to work for a living, but oh. <laughs> you know, I wish I could go because those that lineup right there. Oh my God, Dr. G Goldhammer! I mean, he's incredible. I mean, I've just been following him forever and watching him. He's just incredible. So, yeah, Katie May, uh, I love her cooking and and all the, her pieces there. Oh my gosh! And Victoria, yeah. through her oh. Main Street Vegan Productions, has just produced a major film called A Prayer for Compassion. Oh. And it's really about the, really the spiritual foundation of this vegan plant-based lifestyle and how important that is for solving some of the real major problems affecting the globe today, including climate change. And yeah. So we're gonna be one of the early places to screen this movie at this event also. So it's gonna be an unbelievable event. 
Victoria. And it's, been, and it's a great vacation educational retreat for people that want to get away oh, right in that early part of the new year when we all make resolutions, mm -hmm. have a hard time sometimes sticking to them. This will be that jump start to really get it going in your life and, and, and you know, giving yourself that opportunity to succeed. And I'm excited about it. I'm really excited about oh, it. Oh, my God. As you should be, right? Yeah. I mean, pulling together all these amazing people in this group. I mean, Victoria Moran, I, you know, we, we catch up and meet each other at different places in New York, you know, because she's in the city. But I, it, she's amazing. She really is. So you've got a great lineup. So mazel tov on that. I mean, awesome. Yeah, and I yeah. urge people to follow up for that information. Just to go to balanceforlifeflorida.com. Right. 800 number is 800-663-9292. And they can find any additional information, all core for reservations. And right now there's a major discount. So we have made an unbelievably affordable price with a major discount for people that register before the middle of December. And uh -huh. we urge everybody to come on down. We're really looking forward to just oh having a blast with everyone. And it's going to be a blast. It's really going to be amazing. Oh God. And you're right on the beach, right? Right. I mean we walk out our door. We're right on the beach in the ocean. Oh. And Deerfield Beach is exquisite. There's a pier there. The sun rises there every day. It's just remarkable. Oh, awesome. Mm -hmm. Well, we've got a fantastic topic tonight, epigenetics. But before we begin into this, let's just talk a little bit about some, some of those terms like genetics, genes, DNA. Give us like, you know, because some of us haven't had high school biology for a long time. So give us a, a quick. Well, I think, I, think every, I think everyone's been aware that very recently in the Human Genome Project, they pretty much mapped out a great part of the human genome. So there's about 25 genes which are just repeating units of DNA that are packaged in chromosomes that exist in every cell of the body. I think the most important part of the gene is that genes, this DNA material, is actually coding, it's a code, it establishes the code for all of the proteins in the human body that define all of the function and action, and even a certain degree our personality over time. So, you know, we've uncovered at a very deep scientific level, really the blueprint for life and really mapping out a major part of all of these various protein or genes that code for these very important proteins in our lives. The problem with it is that because all of that is pretty hardwired in a human being, what we're handed down by our parents, grandparents and the like, it left people with the impression that that became a much more important establishment than the things that we choose to do. So for example, we know that there are genetic foundations for a wide range of diseases and dysfunctions that we suffer with. And because of that, it left people with the impression that if you were handed this particular deck of genetic blueprint, that there wasn't much you could do to change it it left people with the impression of a very predetermined state that, so you have, you've heard it and I've heard it where people say, you know what, my father had high blood pressure, my mother had high blood pressure. So you know what, I'm gonna have high blood pressure. Not understanding that we now know that although that foundation of genes is established, it's a hardwired deck of cards, it's still something that's mutable, it's changeable, it's fluid, it's dynamic. So we now know that lifestyle choices that we make on a routine basis can actually modify how that, how that background, that genetic background is actually expressed. And that's where the power is. And that's where the beauty of the whole dance is because now it puts that power back in the hands of the individual to understand that regardless of what you were given, you have a remarkable opportunity by what you choose to do to literally shape the outcome produced by that foundation of your own genes. Yeah, but, but I mean, there's two types of genes. I mean, ones that are, are expressed and ones that aren't. Right. So I think you're talking about the ones that aren't expressed, the ones that tell us that we're gonna have blue eyes, blue hair, or blue hair, not blue hair, <laughs> blonde hair, blue eyes, that kind of thing. Those are the ones that are gonna be expressed and we can't change those. It, but yeah, but, you're talking about the other ones. Yeah, but the, the fact of the matter is you really can't change any of it. 
The problem is, is though there are, you know, you've got 25,000 genes, let's say, in your body for the sake of argument. And like you said, there's going to be hair color, eye color, but these genes are also coding for all of your digestive enzymes. Mm -hmm. There are parts of that gene pool that can promote or even suppress the abnormal growth of cells to produce cancer or to slow it down. So there's a, there's a whole panorama, a whole environment of this genetic machinery that is just kind of hanging there. It's hovering there and will now express under different conditions and environmental influences. And a British physician, uh, Codran Waddington, way back in the 40s, was one of the first people that talked about this interplay of the environment and the genetic matrix that each of us has. And that was really the beginning of the concept of epigenetics, okay. meaning what are those factors that when they are imposed on your deck of genetic cards will now modify what is expressed and what is not expressed. And that's what we're calling the field of epigenetics. Well, I've heard this phrase that your genes may load the gun, but your lifestyle pulls the trigger. Right. Comment yeah. on that. Well, that's exactly what I'm saying. So what, regardless of what that underlying fabric is, what we choose to do can turn on or turn off a certain amount of expression of a wide range of different things in that gene pool that will manifest in different states of well-being so that we now know that the morbidity and mortality of certain diseases like heart disease, cancer, even immune system breakdowns and aging, while they may have a genetic component associated with them, and that's what the loaded gun is. What we choose to do will now fire off certain states of well-being and certain outcomes from that genetic machinery that, way modif that will modify how morbid or, mo or how much those conditions create a sense of mortality and morbidity. So it's very important to realize that we have a lot of power. And this is a beautiful thing for me because as we get deeper and deeper into the science, it only ensures, it only reinforces how powerful the idea of personal choice is. And we don't need to throw that away because I think for too many people, the more they get involved with this hard science of genetics, they think that what they do is less important. We're finding out that it's even more important. And Absolutely. the other side of that coin is to understand, and this is very important, that even with, this, even with the widespread variation in genetics, if you adopt certain lifestyle choices, you're going to develop similar devastating outcomes, even if the genetics are wildly different. And we've seen this in Asia. So for example, for a long time, they had a, a very low fat, low animal based diet, much more plant based, and they had much less obesity and heart disease and certain kinds of cancers especially reproductive cancers of the breast, ovary, uterus, prostate. And what happened is, is, is they started to adopt some of the choices of the West. They wanted to emulate. So they started incorporating more animal fat and animal protein and all of the refined processed foods. They started developing all of the same pathologies that we have, obesity, heart disease, cancers, regardless of their tremendous genetic differences. So that's very important. To understand right. that even with widespread genetic difference, you can create the same outcomes by the choices that you make. So every one of us needs to understand the power that we have to make these kinds of changes and how it will affect our cells at the deepest, deepest, deepest level, even in our gene pool. So what is epigenetics? Epigenetics is just that, the impact of the environmental choices and the environmental exposures that we have and how they affect the gene pool. And we can create examples in three different areas that are profound for that. One is nutrition, one is in the area of exercise and activity, and one is in the area of stress management. We now, as much as we have always talked about the importance of these areas, and they are important, it wasn't until very recently that we understand how profound these choices actually are because they're modifying what's going on at a genetic level. So for example, some years back, Dean Ornish did a, a, set of, a set of studies on people with prostate cancer. 
And this was published in the Proceedings for the National Academy of Science, a very reputable journal. And what they did is they did biopsies on these prostate cancers of a certain group of men, and then they subjected them to a lifestyle modification. And that modification was that they went on a whole food plant-based approach with less than 10% fat. They walked and did exercise for 30 minutes, five to six times a week. They did some yoga and progressive relaxation techniques, and they even did some psychological counseling. So there was a nutrition and exercise and a stress management component. And what they discovered was in the space of months when they re-biopsied those tissues, they noticed that over 450 genes that would promote cancer were actually turned off. <gasps> they were turned off by that lifestyle modification. Oh and, my gosh. and men that stayed on that program for the next year showed dramatic decreases in prostate-specific antigen, PSA, that's usually associated with prostate, right. and, and they had eight times less cancer growth compared to the controls that went back to their old ways of eating, standard American diet, exercising less. So this was a very profound observation oh of how God. lifestyle modification directly changed genetic expression. And what was intriguing is that the, the men, uh, in, in even dealing with heart disease, when they took men that stayed on the same program and monitored them over time, they found out that in about 12 weeks, they turned, on, they turned off a certain number of genes, 40 or so genes, and by a year, over 140 genes that were involved in triggering inflammation and damage to blood vessel walls. So the genetic expression of, of chemicals and proteins that would promote inflammation and damage to the walls of blood vessels were also turned off within a three month period and then dramatically over a year period. You know, 140 plus genes that would be involved in inflammation and blood vessel damage were turned off by lifestyle modification. That's what we mean by epigenetics. Wow. That we make choices that you wouldn't think would operate at such a deep cellular level, but they are going into that environment and affecting how genes are turned on and how genes are turned off. So, and now we've seen it with other studies too that related to nutrition, exercise, and stress management. For example, they did a study on whole blood in men that are smokers. Now we know that when people smoke, that's a major damaging toxic state and it creates a lot of free radical damage. And we know that free radicals are quenched, if you will, by antioxidants. And antioxidants- well, What's a free radical for people who don't understand? Because we okay. hear this term bandied about- A free about. radical is any species of chemical in the body that has what we call a free unpaired electron at a, at a chemical cellular level. And understand this, it stems from the idea that if you look at something like oxygen, oxygen is a bit of an unstable element because as an atom, it lacks two atomic particles called electrons. And without getting crazy, these are just little negative clouds that are part of the basis of the oxygen atom. But because oxygen is missing two of these, it spends most of its waking state trying to find, beg, borrow, steal these electrons wherever it can find it, because oxygen, like all of us, is just looking for a stable relationship. <laughs> and if it finds them in your brain, it will rip them out of your brain. If it finds them in your heart, it will rip them out of your heart. So the bottom line is we have been able to create a stability of oxygen by combining it with, ox with hydrogen to produce water in the human body. If you think about it, the water molecule is H2O, so two atoms of hydrogen each can donate an electron to oxygen. So in the water molecule, you have the most stable and least offensive form of oxygen because oxygen can produce energy in the body when we eat carbohydrates, but oxygen is a double-edged sword. It can produce harm. Think about a metal object rusting in your garage or think about a building being worn away by the presence of oxygen over time. So by producing the water molecule, it allowed us to survive because we're 70% water. 
the planet Earth is 70% water. If it wasn't for the water molecule, the devastating effects of oxygen would go unstopped and it would create havoc and we would not have survived as a species. But here's the issue. When we're processing chemicals in the body, when we're exposing things to oxygen, when we're putting high heat and pressure into oils and fats, we're literally creating these species of chemicals that have unpaired electrons. And because they do, they're very unstable and they're very reactive. So they will cause damage. They will cause damage to the membrane of cells. They will cause cells to begin to produce cancer. So as it turns out, antioxidants, is free radicals, another name for them, are oxidants. For, uh, antioxidants are chemicals that will literally donate that electron that the free radical wants and now will quench its ability to cause damage. Wow. And as it, turns, as it turns out, where do we find antioxidants? Basically in the colors of fruits and vegetables. So the greatest antioxidant potential is in the fruits and vegetables that we're consuming, probably 50 to 60 times greater than any of the standard foods, especially meat, dairy, and the things that most people are typically eating. So the antioxidant potential of plants and fruits and vegetables is off the charts. So understand this study now. They took whole blood from smokers, where now you have the free radical damage of cigarette smoke which will cause all kinds of damage in the body. And of course, eventually can cause cancer if it goes on long enough to the lungs and other tissue that it constantly is exposed to. So in this study, they took whole blood of men that of smoking, of smoking men that were now exposed to three levels of nutrition. And one level was men that were given high antioxidant nutrition from plant foods. And these plants were things like, you know, broccoli and greens, and they were given pomegranates and berries and, and a number of foods of this kind. Another Super high group, in antioxidants. Very high antioxidants. Another group got kiwis alone, and a third group just stayed as the control with the standard diet. What they discovered was that the group on the fruit, kiwi, turned on about five different genes that increased what are called repair enzymes. They turned on genes that produce proteins that repair damaged DNA. When you smoke, DNA gets damaged. The, high, the group on the highest antioxidant intake turned on about 25 genes that increase the repair of DNA. So it was a classic example of how a plant-based approach, a broad vegan plant-based approach in looking at whole blood genetic material was actually helping the body improve its immune support by improving the production of repair proteins to fix DNA at a genetic level. Well, Think wait, 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 wait. So one group was just on whole food plant-based. Right. The other group was just on kiwi fruit? Just on kiwi fruit to see if just one isolated little bit of fruit. And mm -hmm. then the third was on a standard diet. And what okay. they found was that the group on the fruit did have some increase in the DNA repair enzymes, but the ones on the antioxidants turned on 25 different genes that could remarkably increase the production of proteins. Remember, genes code for proteins. Right. And these proteins were repair enzymes. They're enzymes that specifically repair DNA. And so these men that were smoking now had a, a, a greater chance to repair their damaged DNA because of the whole fruit, a uh, whole food plant-based approach. So it's just an example of how a broad whole food plant-based diet can actually modulate the body's ability at a genetic level to repair DNA oh that is gosh. damaged by environmental toxicity and the like. This is very, very powerful. So, like, and, and, seriously? People and people don't really understand how powerful this plant-based program is because when you think about the fact that it can modify how we repair the deepest level of damage in our own DNA material, this is profound. This is well, profound. How, how does the DNA get modified in a way that turns the genes on and off? Okay, this is a great, great question. And without getting too deep, there are a couple of processes that happen in the body. One is something that is called methylation. Now, methylation is just a little chemical group that has a carbon atom with hydrogens around it. This methyl group can actually go into the gene pool and it can attach 
to the DNA nucleotides, the, the things that make up the DNA, the, the, the things that make up our genes are a series of DNA nucleotides mm -hmm. that it's kind of like a little subsection of DNA, a grouping of DNA that now is laid into our chromosomes. These methyl groups can go in and attach to certain sites on that DNA group of molecules on that genetic material. And when they attach, they can either suppress or promote certain genes to turn on or off. So methylation directly can affect the string, the strand of DNA, the grouping of nucleotides that make up a gene. And right. that can now allow certain parts of the gene pool to express. So classic example, I'll give you a classic example. We have known for a long time that exercise is beneficial. We know this. It's also data that suggests that exercise can reduce the risk of cancer for people that do it on a routine basis. Here's an interesting piece. Wait, wait a minute. That, when you say routine, what, what are we talking? We're talking, well, let me explain it. Let me explain the study that was done and you'll get a picture of this a little okay, bit. Okay, okay. We're I'm talking about doing it. We're talking about doing it a certain amount of time, maybe 20, 30 minutes, four times a week, let's say, for the sake of argument. Okay. Could be walking. But we've known that it was beneficial. What we didn't know is how deep it can modify the benefit that we're going to express. We now know that when methyl groups attach to certain promoter genes, cancer promoter genes in the gene pool, it will turn on cancer growth. It will turn on the ability of cells to become more cancerous. And so they're called promoter genes. They can promote cancer. There's also genes that are called suppressor genes mm -hmm. that when they are activated, they will suppress cancer growth. So get this. We now know that exercise will decrease what's called the methylation of promoter genes to reduce the risk of cancer. Women who were put the, the uh, women who were exercising about 130 minutes a week, which is about 25 to 30 minutes, 30 minutes, let's say five times a week. Okay, so we're talking about 25 minutes, five times a week, doing just walking compared to women who only exercise 21 minutes a week. So they had a very high exercise group and a very low exercise group. Get this: the woman in the high exercise group turned on about 40 different genes, three of which dramatically reduced the promotion of cancer and increased breast cancer survival. And women who exercise even more than that during the week could create a situation where there was as much as a 60% drop in breast cancer outcome or a 60% improvement in breast cancer survival by the simple act of exercising, exercise, decreasing the methylation of cancer promoter genes in the cells. So this is a remarkable observation that that occurred. And, and again, we now know that methyl groups, by the way, are provided for by many of the foods that we eat. Well, that was so, one of my questions, yeah. is what are some of the nutritional So sources? think about this, all of the cruciferous veggies, all of the B vitamins that are in our greens and our grains, all of the methyl groups that are found in leafy greens, things like folic acid, things like vitamin B, all the B vitamins are what we call methyl donors. So when we're eating foods that are high in those, and those are things like what, broccoli, cruciferous veggies, things of that nature. That means, you know, bok choy, all of the deep greens, talking about strawberries. These things provide methyl groups to the system. And we now know that when our diets are deficient in these, the gene pool can be under methylated and can actually be more cancer promoting. So now we know that these foods that are providing, that are acting like methyl donors are actually methylating suppressor genes that would typically shut down cancer growth. So we now have another area where we now see how this incredible dietary plan that we're eating, this whole food plant-based approach is actually suppressing at a deep cellular level, genes that would turn on cancer growth and things are now being turned off. And we see with exercise, how genes, these promoter genes are also being turned off by ongoing exercise to reduce cancer risk and improve cancer survival. So we see it in the case of food, 
we see it in the case of exercise, a dramatic benefit that can occur. By the way, when brain cells, when the gene pool, when the genes and brain cells are methylated, it also triggers the production of a certain amount of what are called transporter proteins that help the body reuptake transmitters that are released in the brain. So when you look at things like SAMe, S-adenosylmethionine, or you look at folic acid, these methyl donors in the brain are allowing these genes or promoting these genes to produce transporter proteins that balance the release and uptake of transmitters and are natural ways to treat depression and things that are going on on an emotional level, at a genetic level. Understand that now. So the background, the foundation for even what happens in our emotional state genetically can also be modified by these nutritional donors of methyl to this group. And we call that methylation. Now, wow. So wait, 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 wait. So your, your, how you feel, your, all, all of these things can be controlled by this DNA methylation? Yeah, think about this. If I'm going to release a transmitter like serotonin, in my brain that's linked with me feeling a sense of well-being or dopamine in my brain. We know that the body fine tunes the responses on an emotional level by not only releasing those transmitters, but by being able to selectively take them back up. So it creates another level of modulation and control. That's why a lot of the drugs that people take for depression are what are called serotonin, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. They inhibit the body from taking serotonin back up so it lingers longer, giving you a sense of being a little bit more up and less depressed. Marion Smith jumped in and wanted to know, is it almost like a runner's high? The runner's high is more of the endorphins, which is another class of transmitters that are released when we exercise. But yes, it's a similar idea that you have chemicals in the brain being released that will give us that feeling of elation and well-being and high. In this particular case, though, what's important to understand is that the drugs that are trying to modify uptake, unfortunately, create such a flurry and an imbalance on so many levels that if there's a better and more natural way to do that, it's much more to our advantage. As it turns out, when you're eating these foods that are providing this methyl donation to the gene pool, they're actually affecting these transporter proteins that are produced in the brain that are effectively in a more healthy and natural way modulating that uptake. And, and really taking care of conditions like depression. That's why for a while they were using the supplement like SAMe as an antidepressant. It's better actually to have it in the broad vegan diet when you're getting all of these remarkable cruciferous veggies, all the B vitamins provided for by leafy greens, by whole grains, things of this nature. But just understand how deep this goes. That you're so actually- wait, wait, What was the supplement you said? Well, there was a time when they were, you know, people would give SAMe as a supplement or even folic acid as a supplement. Same but again, think about, but think about folic acid. It comes from the Latin folium, uh-huh. which really comes from our English word foliage, which is, of course means you find it in all the deep greens. So when you're eating a diet loaded with deep greens, you're providing this methyl component to the gene pool, to the body at large, and it can effectively help to modulate that genetic expression of proteins that will play a role in balancing depression, anxiety, and other things. But this is a really intriguing thing to understand how powerful those nutritional inputs could even be. So methylation is one way that the gene pool can be modified. There's another couple of ways. Let me share one more. I don't want to make it too complicated, but this is very cool. Go. In the, in the cells, the genetic machinery, the DNA, if you will, is corralled by a class of proteins that are called histone proteins. These are like ribbons, spooled ribbons that wrap around the genetic material that can either compress it or relax, allowing the genetic material, the actual genetic environment to compress and expand. Think about how dynamic this is now. And so when those spools of protein, those histone proteins, If they get too snug on that DNA, that genetic material, certain sites of the DNA will not be available for activation. 
and other sites may be. So how those proteins compress and open up will allow certain sites to be promoted and or, or suppressed. It turns out that those histone proteins can be modified by methyl groups and other things. And when they're modified, it will change how they compress and expand the genetic material. And depending on how that occurs, it will affect potentially cancer growth, potentially heart disease, potentially any number of things. So there are data to support the idea that we're seeing this kind of modification occur. And so again, all of those methyl rich foods, garlic, onions, cruciferous veggies, and so on, we now know that they will affect the histone proteins in a way to suppress cancer growth. So wow. when, when we've talked about the anti-cancer properties of those foods, we, there are now data to really suggest how that's actually happening. Oh and my gosh. Happen, and it's happening. And of course, there's more to the story. There's more that we don't know. But think about what we do know, how unbelievably beautiful that really is, how magnificent that really is, that you've got this dynamic dance of DNA and the genetic machinery that can open and close and expand and contract. You've got proteins that package around it, weaving their way and spooling their way around them, and they can be modified to change how they open and close certain sites, allowing that to be exposed or not, and allowing certain promoter or suppressor genes to be expressed and activated. Wow, we've got a question. Yes, Marianne, please. Marianne Smith would like to, to know, can you be too old to change your genetics? Well, that's a great question. I personally, you know, look, I, when we look at people clinically, I'll answer it in a different way. I never play God because no matter what, I've had people even at advanced ages that were told they were never going to achieve this or there's, never, there's no way that they're going to recover. And they, in fact, do. So we don't know the full extent of the damage in any one person's body. And my opinion is you're never at a loss to do the things that we know are the healthiest and less risky because the power and wisdom of the body itself and what it's capable of doing in recovery is far beyond any of our educated minds. And if I, if I have a nickel for every doctor that told somebody they were going to die in six months to a year and that person did some of what we're talking about and they buried that doctor. I right. can't tell you how many times that has occurred. So I never play God with that. What I tell people, look, is look, scientifically, we know that there are certain things that increase your risk and there are certain things that will improve your opportunity for well-being and the outcome of health. Why not try to do those things as much as you possibly can and see where it takes you? And we see people in elder years reversing heart disease, reversing diabetes, improving their blood pressure, all of these things changing dramatically. But understand now that the simple lifestyle factors of eating whole food plant-based, simple activity, and we didn't even touch on stress management. That's a whole other area. And we can touch on that too, because stress management has tremendous impact on aging at a genetic level and disease at a genetic level. For example, and we'll share this one little piece because this is one of my favorites. Apple and Blackburn did a study where, let's step back a step. When we look at chromosomes in a cell, we know that cells have a natural lifespan. So every cell that's produced in the body lives a certain amount. Blood cells live 60 to 90 days, 60 to 120 days, let's say, or 90 to 120 days. Other cells have a lifespan. So cells are going to be born. They're going to function for a period of time, and then they're going to die. While they're functioning, they may have to divide, and new ones have to be born. Here's the issue. When we look at chromosomes in a cell, every cell has the exact same number of pairs of chromosomes. So every cell has to have your full complement of genes. So when a cell divides, the new cell has to have all of that genetic material. So you've got to divide the chromosomes as well as the cell itself. You've got to share that genetic information. When we look at the chromosomes on the tip of the chromosomes, we have a little repeating units of DNA that are called telomeres, telomeres. And they're kind of like the hard cap on the end of a shoelace. You know, when you look at shoelaces, you got that yeah. hard thing, keeps right. the shoelace from fraying. 
That telomere is like the cap of that chromosome. And as cells age, what we find that through the process of cell division, that telomere gets shorter and shorter and shorter. So the shortness of telomeres is related to the process of cellular aging in the body. We also know that there's an, L, uh, an enzyme called telomere ACE that helps the telomere to lengthen. So it wants to keep that telomere youthful and lengthen as much okay. as it can. Okay, so the million dollar question, well, let me, how were we gonna get that telomere race? Oh, here, so get this now. So they did a study on young women in their 40s who were caring for chronically ill children, Ooh. their children. Now we have known for a long time that caregivers are a great model for how chronic stress compromises the immune system. We know that caregivers of Alzheimer's patients, caregivers of family, caregivers of sick children often have slower wound healing. They can be more prone to bacterial and viral infection. So we know it can compromise immunity. So understand this particular study. They looked at these women, these mothers caring for their children, and they actually took a blood sample from them and looked at the genetic material in their white blood cells and they have an assay where they could actually assay the length of the telomeres in those white blood cells. Wow. And they could assay the enzyme telomere ACE that allows that telomere to lengthen in the process of cell division. Now, don't do this at home. Trust me, you can't do that assay at home. This is very sophisticated. But yeah, here's the, bottom, I was gonna say. here's the bottom line. The women who cared more chronically for their sick and disabled children when they evaluated the aging of their genetic material, while they were the same chronological age, they were all women in their 40s, the women under that stress aged 10 years more biologically by the shortening of their telomeres. So the stress of our lives shortens telomere length and can affect genetic aging at a deep cellular level. So they did a study, you ready for this, with Alzheimer's, people caring for Alzheimer's patients and family members with Alzheimer's. I mean, that is tough. When you're dealing with somebody, I mean, it's, we just- It's abysmal, it's brutal. It's unbelievably oh brutal. So anyway, these people had compromised immunity. They also had depression and they also showed shortened telomere length because of that chronic ongoing stress. But meditation, a meditative component, and understand this, only 12 minutes for eight weeks dramatically increased the length of telomeres. It recovered telomere length and an increase in telomere ACE activity by the simple act of meditation. So we now saw how just doing a simple meditative process, could be breathing, could be relaxation, doesn't really matter, has an impact at a cellular level and it also modified depression. So we know, we've known for a while that people that exercise more, that meditate more, can actually have a way to solve some of their own anxiety and depression. We now know that it's even happening at a deep genetic level wow. where the gene pool is being affected and the aging process is being affected. So exercise also, by the way, not only does it decrease cancer promoter methylation of genes, mm -hmm. but you're ready for this? Exercise also lengthens telomeres. So we now know that exercise is an anti-aging component wow. to our lifestyle. And okay. all it takes is that 20 to 25 to 30 minutes, four to five times a week, and I don't care what you do, walk, run, bike, swim, skate, do something. Nobody gets a reprieve. You've got to be active. But understand how powerful that is, that this, this simple stress management activity, just 12 minutes daily for an eight week period showed a remarkable impact on reducing genetic aging by telomere length, increasing telomerase activity, and also reducing depression in this caregiving population caring for dementia, friends, family members. Pretty that profound. That is tough. That Pretty is profound. tough. Yeah. I mean, my mother-in-law just passed on this year from you know Alzheimer's and just watching her progress she went in at 72 72 she went in right and right. and just the impact I, I just want to talk a little bit about the impact of the cost of this because we have an epidemic coming up of Alzheimer's 
or dementia. You know, dementia is more of an, a, an umbrella term. But it, she went in, the cost per month was $4,000. And this was not in a you know, major metropolitan city. She went in at $4,000 a month, okay? And she went in at 72 and she died when she was almost 80. And it was over $9,000 a month. A month. Who is going to pay for this? Seriously. No, and look, it, also we have data to suggest that in the next five years, it's going to be almost a 60% increase in adult onset diabetes. Who's going to take care of these bills? And the corollaries to that are what? Obesity, heart disease, amputation, mm -hmm. kidney right. disease, kidney damage, brain damage. I mean, the bottom line is we need to understand that of all the trillions of dollars that we spend on healthcare, between two and $3 trillion a year, which is outrageous, right. more than 75% of that money is being spent for conditions that we can solve by routine lifestyle choice. Right. It's important and to understand that 75 to 80% of everything we suffer with can be solved by making the choices that we're talking about. And what's profound is that we now see how these simple, basic lifestyle choices are affecting yes. us at the deepest, yes. deepest, deepest cellular level. Absolutely. It's hard, it's hard to turn away from that. It's hard to turn your back on that. I know, we've right? Got to, we've got to embrace the power of that and to put that back into what I'll call a biology of hope, understanding that you have this power, that you do not have to drown in your own gene pool. Right. No matter, no matter what your deck of genetic cards are, this can take you away from the fear that many people have that they're going to be corralled. They're going to be held hostage by this genetic foundation, this genetic environment that they were handed intergenerationally. And we now can see that from the data, from the science that's been done and more science that will be done, that simple nutritional changes, whole food, plant-based, getting that wide range of cruciferous veggies, B vitamins, all the things that whole foods provide, all those antioxidants that it provides, by increasing physical activity, by taking time to step back from the chatter of our lives and entertain some stress management process, that we are affecting so much expression of what's going on at a deep genetic in, uh, level in the, in the deepest part of our cells to either turn on or turn off genes that can be promoting heart disease, cancer, and the like. And we have that within our reach so that we don't need to get lost in that genetic environment. We need to focus on what we can change. You're not going to change the hardwired blueprint that you were given, but you sure as heck can change what part of it is expressed, when it is expressed, and how much the expression is going to affect your morbidity and mortality from some of the major pandemics that we suffer with as a culture. And we have that all within our reach. Yes, and Peggy is saying, Peggy said, oh, I better start doing exercise daily and meditation daily. Yes, Peggy. Yes, that's what we're saying. Those are part yes. of our, those are the things that are going to slow down the, they're going to rewind our clock. They're going to slow down aging for us. They're going to improve our ability to function with better muscle strength and activity. They're going to improve our performance. They're going to reduce cancer risk. All of those things are real. And now there's science that, you know, highlights the power and the impact of lifestyle modification at a deep cellular level. We can't turn our back on it. We can't turn away from it. We need to embrace it. It's got to be embraced. So let me, let me circle back. Yeah. Let's say you're diagnosed with cancer. Okay? Right. And, and we get onto the medical treadmill. Right. So, you know, because a lot of people get onto this medical treadmill and they don't know what to do. They don't have a background education like Dr. Frank Sabatino, who has been with the National Health Association for, I don't know, like a zillion years, like when the dinosaurs roamed the planet. Ooh, that, that many years, right? Yes. Yeah, right? <laughs> so, okay, so let's say you go on, you, you're diagnosed with cancer, you, they recommend um, you know, chemotherapy, radiation, you've already done the surgery to cut it out. Okay, so here's my question. Would going on a plant-based diet then, and all these other pieces that you're talking about, you know, getting some of the exercise, walking, would that help them in this process? Well, we, well, we, we see that it actually does. I mean, I, I can't tell anybody what to do. 
the right? bottom line is the standard forms of treatment have been devastating and deadly for so many. I mean, if you go back into the 50s, 60s, we were looking at cancer rates that were like one in six to 700. It is now one in three. So I, I pose the question to you, are we really winning the war on cancer? I, <laughs> yeah, would say, no. I would say that we're not. And I would contend to you and I would state that, look, once you've developed it, you're playing catch up baseball. So you gotta, you know, you're gonna do whatever you think is gonna be right for you and your family. If it was me and it was an operable tumor that I could prune the tree and remove it and it wasn't going to affect other parts of my body, I would probably do it and then embrace vigorously the lifestyle program that we know. We know that when you're eating in this plant-based manner, you're getting away from the dairy and animal products that promote so many growth factors like insulin-like growth factor one, right. things that are going to trigger growth and cancer growth. They're going to affect genetic expression also. So we're getting rid of all of those growth factors. We're really allowing the body to really resolve some of the tissue changes. So for my money, I would still, for me, want to adjust the lifestyle factors in any way that I could to give me the greatest opportunity to get well. And I think I'm, I'm soured on the typical approaches because a lot of the drugs and procedures that are used to treat cancer wind up compromising the immune system significantly worse. And many times you don't see any recovery, but you just see people holding on with these forms of treatment. And it's brutal to watch. It's hard to watch people dying in front of your eyes on treatments where they're looking for hope. And my feeling is, like I said, if it was an operable situation, but once you start getting into heavy chemo and radiation, you're starting to get to a place where the body can be really quite damaged. And my feeling is I would definitely try to take a more natural alternative approach totally into whole food, plant-based foods, totally into some modest activity, working with the stress management, see where all of that takes you. And mm -hmm. if you still opt for medical treatment, let's suppose you opted for the chemo or whatever, I still would do all of that. Because well, I think, you know, a lot of the gonna, people- it's still, gonna give you, it's still gonna give you some benefits. So my opinion right. is no matter what choice you make, Come right. back to that whole food plant-based approach. Right. Come back to that use of physical activity. Work on that stress component. We know that all of those things are going to be affected. Oh, absolutely. But I think a lot of people just are, are so scared. They're so panicked because, you know, they hear that, you know, cancer word, it's almost like a death sentence and you just don't know where to turn and you just become so glazed over and they just get you right on the medical treadmill. I mean, they just start, Let's you, face it, you the know. Key, the key is to prevent it as much as you can. Right. We, we know enough about prevention. And again, we're, look, we're inundated by chemicals around us, but we know enough about prevention in how we're eating and what we're doing to give ourselves a chance to not create that outcome. Once you have that outcome, it's a bit of catch up baseball. So now you've got to do whatever you can to try to allow the body to recover and deal with those cancer cells. Well, look, we've got, we've got some data that suggests certain kinds of fasting care can actually help to shrink tumors and things of that nature. We know that the plans that we've talked about here with uh, food choices, exercise, some of that can have a big impact on helping to slow down the way the body promotes cancer and can affect that genetic you know, environment that is either suppressing or promoting cancer. So there's things that we can do. And I think we need to set all of that in motion as much as is possible. Right. Marianne, yep. Get out and walk those dogs. You have walk no them. excuse. Let's go. Get walk out them, and walk them. them. So let's recap. To sum it up, whole food plant-based, to meditate, and to exercise. Sum it up by saying that we all have a genetic environment that we were handed down, that we, that we inherited. But we now know that that genetic environment is not static. It's very fluid, it's pliable, it's dynamic, it's a shimmering tapestry that is capable of being modified by conditions that we impose from the outside in the routine lifestyle choices that we're making. And when we make those choices in the direction of whole food, plant-based nutrition, with good consistent activity, and some degree of stress management to deal with the stress and chatter of our lives, we now have scientific data that is quite clear 
that will show us that those lifestyle factors can actually turn on, turn off, and modify how that genetic environment expresses itself to either promote or to reduce pathological changes in our lives from everything from aging, inflammation, cancer, and the like. And that puts the power back in our hands. It puts the power, puts the ball back in our court to realize that we're just not you know, subject to this deterministic outcome, that we have a unique opportunity to improve our quality of life and health by routine choices that are establishing healthful living. And that's where we want to go. Well, Dr. Sabatino, this has been amazing. You are a fount of knowledge. And just in case anybody's just tuning in and does not know, Dr. Sabatino has a great program coming up January 5th through the 9th in, at the Wyndham Hotel in Deerfield Beach, Florida. And the website is balanceforlifeflorida.com. And tell, share with us the lineup one more time. The lineup is my person, and understand, these are people that I handpicked and invited because I know that they are some of the best presenters, the most knowledgeable, the most compassionate, understanding, and entertaining, and the information that they are going to share is going to literally transform people's lives. That's Dr. Al, that's Dr. Alan Goldhammer, who runs True North out in California, <laughs> Stefan Esser, who's an incredibly well-trained medical physician who's worked at the Mayo Clinic and is in private practice in North Florida. Well, and and his home. grandfather, right. his grandfather. And his grandfather was one of the icons. Right. Dr. Bill, yeah, Dr. William Esser, one of the icons of water-only fasting and the hygienic movement. Uh, Victoria Moran, who for 40 years has been staying the course. She's a prolific vegan author and the director of Main Street Vegan Academy in New York and has produced a remarkable film called A Prayer for Compassion that we're going to screen at this event. We have Oceanfront. We have all the plant-based meals. It's all inclusive. We've got yoga and Tai Chi and walking and the ocean. It's just going to be Ooh. a remarkable event. And people that are going to come are going to be transformed by this. And I look forward to seeing as many people of this audience that could make it to come. Oh, my and God. And I can't say call, enough. Go online and come and play with us. Oh, my God. I, I wish I could go. I really do. But I, I have to teach. So I wish I could go. But... It's amazing. I can't, your program just sounds incredible. So beautiful. it's a beautiful yeah. And if somebody needs, and especially if somebody's just been diagnosed with, with issues and health problems, you know, instead of going the traditional medical treadmill, you know, connect with Dr. Sabatino, ask him first. And one of the things I love, I, in one of the other shows I did with Pam Popper, she says, corral and get a posse together get a group of people that are right. knowledgeable, that can help you to make decisions that are outside the box, not necessarily on the medical treadmill, and start thinking how you can change your health destiny without going on the medical treadmill and getting right. yourself on And it. even if you, so, keep your, if you keep your box, your specialists, whoever you wanna keep, your GPs, your internal yeah. people, keep them all if you have to. Just get another perspective. So you've got another viewpoint. You've got another way to look at what you're processing and sometimes that new perspective can just be the thing that really makes the difference between wellness and, and disease. And, and it really can be profound. Or death. I mean, let's, and, or, let's and face or it. Death. Yeah, and or death, too. Let's face it. I mean, that's what we're trying to avoid in right. all, you know. I mean, I, I mean, frankly, I mean, this is one of the reasons why I'm doing this. Because I, I want to spend the rest of my life, you know, whatever I have on this planet, I want to spend it out there hiking and biking and kayaking up on Cape Cod, preferably. Well, but, but this, is the, this, there, is, but... this is the important point, because look, I can go out tomorrow and get hit by a car and my life is over, let's say, for the sake of argument. Right. But the reason I do this lifestyle and have done it for as long as I have, because it allows me the opportunity to perform and function at the highest level, regardless of age. When I get up in the morning, if I want to walk, I'm pain free when I get up. If I want to go out and walk, I know, if I right? want to run, if I want to swim, I've got this opportunity, what I call this functional aging, this high level of performance. And the beauty of it is that this lifestyle reduces inflammation. It reduces pain. It allows us to function at a very high level. So it's about really adding life to our years, not just years to our lives. And we live in a culture where the idea of just living longer, lasting longer, seems to be some kind of badge of honor 
when in fact it's not if you don't have the function and the ability to really enjoy and appreciate the quality of your own life. That's what this lifestyle does. It gives you that quality of life. Right. Well, Sharon McRae said she's going to be there. So look for Sharon. I'm looking okay. for her. Tell her to come and say hello to me when she comes. Come, come, come give her a big hug when she comes. Absol- absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. All right. Well, because I've heard the expression, we're not living longer, we're dying slower. And yeah, I think it's true. And in a way, it's true. And I spent a lot of years in aging research. And we know that the things that we're talking about in this lifestyle are the things that are the common denominators that improve longevity and improve function in those years. And that's what we want to do. We want that performance. Well, Dr. Frank Frank Sabatino, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, everybody else out there watching. I want to thank all of our listeners, and I want to thank you for this opportunity to just share this time with you all. It was Oh, my God. And you're coming back December 4th. What are we going to talk about? Well, we'll figure it out. Something else. (laughs) Okay. We can talk about anything you want. All right. Well, if anybody out there has some topics you'd like to hear Dr. Sabatino talk about, please. Maybe we can even them. talk about fasting. A lot of people don't understand the power of oh fasting. My God, right. That would, be, that would be a great show. Maybe we can we do, can that. do that. We'll talk we about can talk that. about fasting. Because yeah. I've been doing intermittent fasting, but you've told me that that's not really fasting, but that's fasting, but not really fasting. But so- it's cool. It's cool. It's a break. It gives, <laughs> a, it gives the system a break. But we can exactly. talk about we can talk about all of that and, and really get into a lovely discussion on that stuff. All right. So December okay. 4th, Dr. Sabatino will be back. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jane. Good night, everybody. Good night, John Boy. Every- we good night, everybody. Me and uh, hope next time, hope everything's okay in Chico. So good night. Good night, everybody.